dear guests and dear colleagues, welcome to Roma. It is a great pleasure for me to welcome all the participants, both in person and online, in this second ISTAT's workshop on methodology in official statistics. Being focused on methods, this, work, this workshop is of utmost importance for ISTAT. Good methods make data of good quality. And good quality is the root of the Institute's good reputation. I am confident that the workshop will grant us enough time for going into the detail of the problems encountered in the statistical production processes, as well as to exploring new approaches for satisfying the informative needs of our stakeholders and with re reliable solutions. This is confirmed by the, the teams selected for discussion, new data sources and new methods, especially in the data mining contest. This is a new frontier for national statistical institutes. Depending on the results discussed in occasions like this one, the method discussed today and tomorrow could become common in the next future. Hence, our expectation on what will be presented and debated during these two days are high. This workshop is the result of the effort for several people. In my capacity as acting president, I signed one month ago the establishment of the new advisor committee on statistical methods. The committee members will play different role in roles in these workshops as chairs, discussants, and invited speakers. The committee has been established in 2017, and since it gave support to more than 50 ISTAT's methodological research projects. The first projects, as those related to setting up register and the integrated use of different sources, are now currently used for statistical production. I am thankful to all the members of the Advisory Committee on Statistical Methods, who are leader statisticians who work on different methodological research areas in academic institutions and national statistical institutes, and I appreciate very much their support. I wish to thank the coordinator of the committee, Professor Daniela Cocchi, who is going to chair this committee for the seventh year and the next three years to come. Let me mention all the committee members, starting from those who served in the last term. Professor Natalie Schlomo, University of Manchester. Professor Maria Giovanna Ranalli, Università di Perugia. Professor Lee Chun Zhang, University of Southampton and Statistics Norway. Professor Brunero Liceo, Università La Sapienza di Roma, and Mr. Piero Falorzi, formerly at ISTAT. A very warm welcome to the new members of the committee. Professor Marco Alfò, Università La Sapienza di Roma, Professor David Aziza, University of Ottawa, and Professor Pete Das, Statistics Netherlands and the Indowen University of Technology. I take this opportunity to thank in particular Professor Schlom, who is the president of the International Association of Service Statisticians. We are very proud that one of these workshop sessions is jointly organized with this association. And thank you for the help and the support in organizing this event. I would like to thank all also all those who will present their research results in different sessions. The program includes three master classes by Professor Chambao Hu, University of Waterloo, Canada, Professor Stefano Maria Iacus, Harvard University, and Mr. Fabio Ricciato, Eurostat. 
The workshop will be fueled by speakers from many different institutions, ISTAT Italy, US Census Bureau, INSEE France, Lumsa University Italy, Statistic Austria, and Central Bureau of Statistics Ireland. I am confident that our workshop will consolidate research partnership and favor the creation of new teams to work together on the issues raised in these days. Let's have a good workshop. Thank you. I leave now the floor to the Director of the Department of Statistical Method and Technologies, Mr. Massimo Fedeli. Uh, thank you. Thank you, President, for the introduction. And, uh, Welcome, everybody. I spend just a few minutes to introduce some topics, relevant topics for this workshop. ISTAT and more generally, Statistical Institute are asked nowadays to make an enormous effort to take pictures, give data and information on a reality that is changing faster and faster. The demand for information from stakeholders is increasingly high and varied in its forms. <clears throat> Parallel to this demand, then it's possible have, uh, of having an air to two and presented the amount of information available. <clears throat> Things, for example, uh, of all information on the web, from satellite or even from smart device. This ingredient seems to uh, suggest a marriage that would thus enable a positive response of needs uh, illustrated. As a representative example of this context in ISTAT, we can, for instance, mention the studies initiated on the use of remote sense with uh, the aim of providing new information improving existing information even with the time to, of making the uh, production process more efficient. The case of using remote sensing for urban green estimation will be illustrated in this workshop. Uh, for example, another ISAT project in accordance uh, with Eurostat's uh, innovation agenda concerns the use of ESI data to make uh, uh, the production process of maritime statistics more timely and to enrich the information on these topics. For example, by analyzing the data using network analytics techniques. Still, ISTAT is investing in works that explore sentiment analysis methodologies in order to give a representation with high timelines of people's sentiments on some important issue. In addition to the world of TSS, to which the above example belong, there is also the use of integrated sources, often of the different nature, such as administrative sources and sample sources, which is now inevitable and is of particular relevance in ISTAT production process. However, for a perfect marriage, uh, several issues uh, must be resolved. Among the others, methodological issues are uh, of particular importance. The production of new elements into the statistical production processes <coughs> to complement the classical one based on sample survey or to use it, <coughs> use it to provide a new solution in place a deep reflection on the issue that will be raised and discussed in this workshop. The first question is concerned by, with methodologies and design for multiple multi source processes with not probability data. The issue is critical because new data sources, which may be affected by various errors, can often be made statistical more valid when combined with survey data over which one has full control. To this end, however, techniques need to be developed to allow for this integration and the necessary correction for the use of non-simple data. 
The generally in unstructured nature of uh, big data and the large volume of the data naturally leads to the use of machine learning techniques. Uh, they, they use, they use uh, uh, where in the field of official statistics, need to be further investigated since uh, they have been developed in similar yet different uh, contexts. For example, whether and how to take into account the characterizing elements for survey data set in the case of integration with no probability data is still a sensitive issue. Another important aspect characterizing the production of official statistics concerns precisely the quality of the information produced. For a statistical institute, the situation in which information is disseminated uh, without having assessed the quality of the data cannot exist. It is a concept inherent to the world of official statistics. However, the main measure of quality, especially with the reference to accuracy, uh, has been developed in context that basically refer to the world of sample survey, surveys. The introduction of innovation sources, uh, therefore, entails an investment in this issue as well. <coughs> From this premise <coughs> derives the importance of this workshop on methodology, uh, from which I am sure we will be able to use information to profitable continue in the path taken by the Italian Institute of Statistics. Thank you. And uh, I introduce uh, Monica Pratesi, uh, Head of the Department of Statistical Production. Thank you, Massimo. And thank you for all the things you have already said. So I will focus on something, uh, I mean, uh, that, that is uh, a complement to what you have said, but is something different, I think. So uh, good morning and welcome here. Um, I am working at the statistical production in the National Statistical Institute. So my perspective is a little bit different than uh, Massimo's one but uh, um, not so much. Let me say that uh, today, the impact of this digitization on economic and social spheres of society impose us a continuous learning attitude. Official statistics reflects life. And in a datafied world like the one we live in, it is natural to exploit alternative forms of data collection satellite imagery, data describing transactions, financial transactions, orders, invoices, payments, and also logistic transactions, deliveries, storage records, travel records, but also web data and mobile network operator data, electronic invoices, we, we are in uh, uh, an environment where uh, the European statistical system is pushing towards business-to-business -to -business, um, data uh, uh, transactions. And in this context, e-invoicing uh, is uh, something very important because it's going to uh, become mandatory for companies. So European statistical system and NSIs like the ISTAT are working towards the reuse in the statistical production processes of uh, sources of data, new sources of data, including data generated and held by the private sector, the so-called privately held data. An example for all, the location data that are routinely collected by mobile network operators, the so-called MNO data for short. These are one of the most appealing candidate sources for reuse in official statistics. And we have a project, uh, uh, Massimo, on this. But also uh, one of the most challenging to enabling the production of statistics, delivering a dynamic view on population, of population presence and mobility. It is not easy. You know that the mine of information, this mine of information, hides pitfalls 
in the context of official statistical production. Uh, they are data of various structuring, or rather we could say sometimes unstructured. They often are not designed data, they are found data, which therefore require adaptations, transformations and processing aimed at their use for statistical production processes and purposes. Their integrated use with surveys or administrative data is often of fundamental importance uh, in order to maximize their information potential to support or complement current statistics. We all know that these issues cannot be postponed. At the same time, uh, there is another side of the same coin to consider that is engaging with respondents in surveys and protection of data collected for statistical purposes under the general data protection framework, the very well known GDPF. I do not enter in privacy issues here. I only say that we need to better explore the use of applications, the so-called apps and smart devices in smart surveys. Increasingly low response rates can be contrasted reusing administrative data to lower the respondent burden, but I think that contact policies needs a revision. How to effectively communicate with respondents in this digitization era? We need to improve our response rate with a new contact policy management, better involving local institutions and civil society organizations. Also providing respondents with smart devices as done in citizen science experiments. Smartphones can automate data collection and incorporate many important data gathering functions such as capturing images, audio and text into a single tool that can stamp the date, time and geographic coordinates associated with an observation. So in a few words, mobile applications for smartphones tablets and other gadgets can turn just about anyone into a citizen scientist co-creator of, of official statistics of data. Anyway, this is something that we have in front of us, but and coming to the program of the workshop, I am pleased to know that many of the contributions record production themes population census, price index, mobile data, urban green employment, and this combination of methodological research and thematic innovation is fundamental for the health of the Institute. The integration between the skills of the production sector and those of methodologies is an essential element. No one wins alone. This is clear for, for all of us here. I also note with equal pleasure the presence of master classes held by important international researchers, uh, which are useful for highlighting critical issues and perspectives relating to, to these frontier issues, and also for inserting the, the ESTAT into a context of comparison and international discussion. Last but not least, tomorrow the session co-organized by ISTAT and the International Association of Survey Statisticians, thanks to Natalie Shlomo here, is giving us a, a, another uh, international perspective. I close, I close by spending a few words on quality. The evaluation of data quality is an increasingly multi-source contest in which uh, are involved uh, uh, non-probability, uh, sampling and probability sampling, issues of inference, and new methods as machine learning. And I think that also uh, it is important not to take a wait and see approach with respect to artificial intelligence. Uh, the power of uh, generative artificial intelligence uh, uh, can be something that we have to face with in, in a very near future. So quality, uh, it is important because in the, in the realm of methodologies, often we are working in the uh, context of experimental statistics. 
and there is the need of a transition from experimental to official statistics, and this requires a rigorous evaluation of quality. So, five things to close. Quality is essential. Quality is in the eye of the beholder. Quality in Europe is something coming following the code of practice. It has to be re revised, I think. Uh, the last revision was in 2017. Then, novelties. We, we need to uh, go from novelties to innovation, because in the official statistical institutes, we need for innovation. And this innovation uh, maybe needs a revision of the uh, general statistical production model. Uh, maybe in this one, civil society organizations need to be included. And, um, it is obvious, uncertainty is here to stay, so we need inference and uh, um, environment, social responsibilities of companies, circular economy, pandemics, climate change. I'm citing and quoting the themes of the current statistical production in the Institute, uh, need urge for new survey methods and better integration of administrative data files. So, in principle, there is no difference between theory and, pra and practice, but in practice there is. And so, we, as official statistics, are in quest of sustainable, user-friendly methods with a prompt translation into processes to produce meaningful data on current phenomena. And so, I think that this is a great occasion. Today is a workshop and it is my pleasure to leave the floor to my friend, uh, Daniela Cocchi, for going on during this uh, day. Thank you. I thank you very much for the kind invitation to uh, chair the master classes of this important workshop. Indeed, uh, we know how important is the role of official statistics and how important are the innovations in official statistics because the important role of official statistics now is contrasted by all the of the mass of privately held data that are offered with the, or, or secluded, because uh, the, the point, the problem is rather, in my opinion, uh, two-faced, because uh, private held data are sometimes more quickly available to, uh, uh, to the common people, but the issue of their quality is really very, something that really is, is very in doubtful. And what is requested by official statistics, by, by the people with regard to official statistics, is an issue of timeliness. And the timeliness very often contrasts with quality. And indeed, um, if a result is offered, which is of good quality, but many months later, uh, its expectation, it is considered not so useful by the users. And so, indeed, we are in a moment where the official statistics has to contrast, uh, maybe has to fight, well, it's of course a big word, uh, a, with respect to all the other offers that come from the, from the world, from other 
uh, uh, sovranational uh, owners of data that risk to overcome the honest and sometimes slow production of official statistics. So a, a workshop like this, the fact of uh, uh, having this uh, important interaction between uh, national statistical institutes and academia that is not so common in other countries. So I, I think that indeed the, the, the ESTAT can also uh, offer uh, himself, itself as a, um, uh, really a, a, an innovative and useful and uh, propositive, proactive uh, 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 institutions because indeed um, now there is this problem of the competition and of the flattering of private health data with the problems of privacy, the problems of uh, uh, the granularity of data that is really a, a, a problem. And we do have the main problem. Now it's very, very difficult to conduct survey sampling. And uh, what is commonly done is the collection of non-probability data and uh, how is it possible to render the uh, non-probability service uh, uh, samples something that can be useful and also leader, leader in the world if they are acted, I suspect, in a way that uh, can be surprising, but that ought to become the common practice for everybody who practice statistics. So indeed, while I thank really the, the, the staff of ISTAT for the faith and the confidence that has been uh, done to the uh, advisory committee for methodological statistics, I am very, very proud and happy to, uh, to, uh, to host all, to, uh, and to introduce the, all the uh, master classes that are uh, considered in these three day, two days of common work. And the first speaker is uh, Professor Chao Pao Wu of the University of Waterloo that will speak to us about what are the challenges and the strategies uh, that we face in dealing with no probability service sampling. So Chao Pao, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Ah, I have to, sorry, I, I, I forgot. I have to say something. Um, normally the, the talk is about one hour and then there is let's say half an hour, less, more, I don't know, uh, uh, open to question and the floor discussion. So please, the people that is present and uh, that uh, wishes to uh, pose questions, they are invited to come here because of the registration. And for the people that are, uh, um, that are uh, connected with uh, us via the web, please write their questions on the chat. And uh, the discussion so will be open both to the people that are present, but also to the very welcome people that is uh, connected uh, outside this very wonderful room. Thank you. Please, Joe Paul. Uh, thank you so much, Daniela. This is the first time in a long time I'm sitting here giving a talk. Uh, that's not the usual way we do it um, uh, at a conference. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. I uh, see a lot of uh, old friends. Uh, I think the pandemic separated us for the last three, four years. I haven't got a chance to see uh, many of them. So the title of this uh, talk is uh, Challenges and Strategies. Uh, in dealing with non-probability survey samples. The challenges are well known. Um, the strategies, are some of the research I did uh, myself uh, with my students and with my collaborators. So I was trying to focus on a few. And you see the uh, title of the section on top of the slides there. Now, the very first question is, uh, what is a non-probability sample? This is a, 
a question everybody seems to know. Well, if it's not a probability sample, then it's a non-probability sample, and that's actually true. Uh, but I tend to have this definition here, where you actually see the two crucial uh, components or factors there. So any sample uh, with unknown participation mechanisms, that is, you don't know how the units are got into the sample, and with unknown sample the population. Now, the sample the population is a population represented by the sample. And with non-probability samples, usually you don't know which part of the population that sample is coming from. So there are many examples these days. Uh, you can call them non-probability samples. The most well-known one is so-called the web panels or phone panels, where uh, commercial companies, they have a long list of uh, uh, units or people. They agree to be on that list to uh, participate in surveys, either for fun, or for some kind of incentives, uh, coupons, and volunteer-based uh, surveys, um, even admin data. So if you have admin data, which is not complete, then you can view that as a non-probability sample. And indeed, even you have a probability sample, say you have a very good sampling frame, you have a very nice uh, stratified multi-stage probability sampling design, but if you have a very large non-response rate, then the final sample technically is a non-probability sample because you don't know how these people got into your final sample. Now, I have a review paper recently published by a survey methodology uh, last year. There's five discussions of that paper, and Shirley Moon of Harvard uh, is one of them. And he said, there's no such thing as a probability sample in real life. So in my rejoinder, I have to uh, respond. So this is what I wrote there. Uh, for human populations, this is probably a defendable statement. Since any rigorous rules and uh, precise proce uh, procedures are almost surely as aspiration, not prescription. Probability samples, however, do exist in other fields, such as uh, business and established service. Uh, agricultural service and a natural resource service, where uh, you don't really have this human behavior uh, in it, right? So you select a piece of land, you go and measure some of the uh, chemical components. The land cannot refuse to say, I don't want to participate, right? So uh, we do have a probability samples. And why non probability samples is a big deal here? Um, we often hear people say, all non-probability samples are by samples, they are difficult to handle. Well, if you think about this carefully, the by sample nature of non-probability samples is not really the key issue. Remember, any samples, as long as it's not an uh, IID sample, they are uh, non-probability non sample in a sense, not by sample in a sense. Because if you take a simple average of the sample uh, mean, and it's not a valid estimate for the population mean. For, for most of the cases, unless you have an IID sample, or in survey sample, you have a simple random sample. But this bias nature of probability samples never be an issue because we have a tool, and that tool is called the Hobson Thompson estimator through inverse probability weighting. So we know the inclusion probabilities for probability samples. And in my uh, course, uh, Professor John Rose says, uh, you should call the HT estimator NHT estimator because the year before that famous Hobbes Thompson estimator, we have uh, another paper, Narin, published a paper in an Indian journal uh, in 1951. So indeed, these days, uh, I do have a few uh, friends, they call this NHT estimator. So the main challenges um, in dealing with non probability samples. Uh, there are three of them I listed here. The first one is the unknown sample participation mechanism. And the se second one is the unknown sample of the population. So you don't know which part of the population that is represented by your data set. And also, the lack of auxiliary information required for valid statistical inference. And so this will become very clear uh, at the end of the uh, presentation today. So where do we start? Well, uh, in statistics, we always start with ideal settings where you have assumptions, 
and you develop methodology and those assumptions. And in real applications, you're trying to answer the question, are those assumptions reasonable in order to defend the way you use your method, right? And you all know this very famous quote by George Box, all models are wrong, but some are useful. So we do start with the models, and then we deal with, are those models really defendable? So the methodologies and the strategies I uh, present today uh, is based on this uh, very popular two sample framework. You have a finite population, which is your target, and you have uh, two type of variables here. The board phase X means the vector of covariates, and the study variable Y, I'm gonna focus on one, and technically I have many. And just makes uh, the problem simple the target parameter is the population mean, okay? So for any statistical problems, if you cannot handle the population mean, then forget about it. On the other hand, if you can develop method for the population mean, and oftentimes it can be extended to other complicated problems. So if you are familiar with survey sampling, you see 60% uh, of the materials deal with the mean, <laughs> but uh, the method can be uh, extended. So we have a non-probability sample I call that SA, and you have both X variables and Y measured for each of the units in the sample. And here's another very crucial uh, assumption about this two sample setting. You have existing probability sample, I call that SB, and you have information on the covariates only, not on the study variables. And you also have this survey weights, I call the DIB. And one of the things here you see, uh, implicitly I assume the, the X variables is observed on both samples. Okay, that can be a problem, so I'm gonna come back on that issue uh, later in the talk. And we have two models, and the first model I call the Q, this is the model, um, in the earlier papers I have, I call this a propensity score model, but in recent uh, years, the last two or three years, I follow some of the, uh, my co-authors, we call this um, models for participation probabilities. So you have these indicators R, one if the unit's I is in the sample, zero otherwise, and the probability of the unit's I in the sample given the characteristics of the units, that is the X variables, Y variables. And it's a very important, usually been overlooked feature of this definition is this participation probability pi i is defined for every single unit in the entire population. Okay, that's a very simple aspect, but it's actually quite crucial uh, later on. And we have uh, another model, I call it Kasai. Okay, and this is called, sometimes called the outcome regression model. So you have a study variable Y, and oftentimes you have this semi-parametric model of condition of first and second moments of Y uh, given X. And a lot of times you have a linear regression model where the first uh, moment, uh, MI, is a linear combination of the X variables. So these two models will be used in a different way depending on the inferential framework. And sometimes you need both. There's a few uh, assumptions used in various research papers, and here are the two very crucial ones. The first one is similar to the missing at random assumption in the missing data literature and causal inference. And we call that ignorability assumption. That is, the sample inclusion of unit i is independent of the study variable yi given the features of the unit. That's the measurement of the x variables. Now, this word ignorability is kind of unfortunate because just because this assumption holds doesn't mean you can ignore all the problems. <laughs> uh, the ignorable, ignor ignorability assumption basically says if this assumption is true, then given the information I have in my sample, which means x and y's, I have a way to do inference, okay? And that's basically the bottom line of that message. The second assumption, sometimes called the positivity assumption, it says 
every unit in the entire final population has a non-zero probability to be included. And this is true for everybody, every unit in the final population. And indeed, uh, the second half of the talk today uh, will have an in-depth discussion on the consequence of violations of this A2. So the two-sample framework here uh, is essentially a data integration problem. So you have a non-probability sample uh, with information on covariance and study variable Y. You have an existing reference probability sample with information on X, so some of the basic auxiliary information and the survey weights. So if you only use any one of them, you won't be achieve the scientific objective you want to address. That is, the non-probability sample, you have X and Y, but there's no way you can do valid inference. The probability sample you already have, you don't have any information on Y, which is the major objective of your study. So, but if you put them together in a suitable way, you can do valid statistical inference. So that's the focus of the second and third uh, section here. Just want to uh, make sure uh, uh, there are questions about the settings here before we move on. Right, so I'm going to spend the next five minutes um, discuss uh, the estimation of this uh, participation probabilities, which is used for inverse probability weighting. Now, in Hobbs and Thompson estimator for probability samples, those inclusion probabilities are precisely decided by the sampling design. In other words, even before I have my sample data, I can compute my inclusion probabilities based on the design information. With non-probability samples, you can't. So how can you uh, estimate the participation probabilities is always well the first thing that, uh, you, you want to uh, start. The so-called IPW estimator, okay, this is a very popular term in missing data and, and causal inference. It's basically the Hobson thompson estimator we have, except you don't know the inclusion probabilities. So you have to estimate this. And sometimes I say this, in official statistics and in survey sampling, we often borrow methodologies developed in other fields and trying to use uh, for estimation and inference with survey data. Uh, Prediction-based approach is one of these examples. But I would say there's a few things we developed in the survey sampling, which later on became hugely popular, useful uh, tools for general statistics. And the Hobson Thompson estimator is one of them. So those people working in survey data, uh, in missing data and causal inference, they thought they invented IPW estimator. And the reality is no, uh, we in survey sampling invented that, that tool, okay? Um, so if you can estimate the uh, uh, participation probabilities, then you, you can use inverse probability weighting to construct an estimator there. There are different approaches on how to estimate the uh, participation probabilities. There are parametric methods, which I will go through uh, three uh, I listed here. Uh, there's a method of uh, Richard and uh, his students, uh, Gio. And there's a uh, sort of maximum likelihood estimate, which is part of the uh, PhD thesis of my students, Elin Chen. And there's also a, a recent method, the two-step method, okay, uh, by uh, Richard and Ian Lee's students uh, at Wang. There's also a, a non-parametric method, which I'm currently working on. I haven't finished that project yet. There's also a tree-based method. Uh, there's a group of uh, researchers at StatsCan, uh, led by uh, John Francois Bomer. Uh, so they were working on uh, this kind of uh, regression trees and how to do uh, uh, estimation of participation, participation probabilities. So I will start with the uh, method of my student Elin Chin in her uh, PhD thesis. She started with this uh, logistic regression model. Indeed, you can impose any parametric model for the binary response R. Remember the R is an indicator for sample inclusion. 
And then once you have a parametric form uh, with parameters alpha in that model, the full likelihood, which is the one in the middle, involved entire population. So you see the, the products from one to capital N. If you take a log, you get this so-called log likelihood. And so, so here is one of the key steps in deriving the final method. So if you shuffle things around a little bit, you see the very last of the uh, equation here in the bottom of the slide, there's a two terms there. The first term uh, involves units in the non-probability sample SA. The second term is a summation over the entire population involves X variables. So for any given alpha, you need XI for the entire population to uh, calculate that term. That's where this uh, two sample framework came in. You say, wait a second, I have a reference probability sample. I can use the information X along with the survey weights D, I, B, just replace the second term in the previous slide is a, is a population total, right? So in survey sampling, whenever you see a population total, you, you get excited. So I have a Hobson Thompson estimate that I can use. So that's exactly what we did here. Is that me or something outside? Is the noise? Outside? Yeah, okay. Um, so now you see, for every given alpha, uh, this L1 uh, became computable. So we call that pseudo local likelihood. So then once you have an objective function here, you can uh, maximize, you can get a, a, the sort of a maximum uh, LE of the alpha, right? The key things mathematically, if you take an expectation with respect to the probability sampling design for the sample B, you get the exact objective function, the log likelihood function. So in, in the sense that in the current two sample setting, this L1, is the best thing you can do in terms of a, a likelihood-based approach. So once you have a, a likelihood, then anything else, just follow the reg regular routine. Um, if you think about the score function, you take a, a partial derivative with respect to the alpha, and the key observation here is the expectation and the general randomization of the probability design P for the sample B, and also the model for the participation probability, which is Q. This U1, you treat that as an estimated function, is unbiased. Now this thing mathematically is important. In the statistical theory, uh, there's a whole uh, literature on uh, estimated equation-based approach. So if you have an unbiased estimated equation, then you can solve estimated equation uh, to get consistent estimate. So that is a, a something uh, very important to notice because this is also the argument I'm going to use in the next section on calibration-based approach. This earlier method, which is actually motivated uh, quite a few later work uh, by Richard and his students, uh, Jir. So they say, here I have two samples, SA, SB. I want to estimate the participation probabilities. So what they did is they pull the two samples together, assuming there's no overlap. So they get, they define this di, the one if unit is in SA, uh, zero if unit in SB. Uh, so the first thing you notice here is this indicator di is not defined for the entire final population. So if you think about the model for the participation probabilities, that model does not lead to any meaningful interpretations of the distribution of the DI because they are formulated in, under a very different framework here. But in any case, so they look at the uh, log likelihood function in my previous uh, slides. But so instead of, um, okay, let me go back to that equation there. Okay, so here is the equation there uh, in, in the second line from the bottom. They realize in the second term there, you involve the, all the units, not in the prob uh, non-probability sample. So their idea is, is there any way I can estimate this, right? So the idea they, they use is they treat it as a population total, but the population size is no longer n. It's n minus number of units in the probability sample. So 
that's where they're trying to do. So they estimate the second term by rescaling the probability weights in the, uh, in the sample uh, B, such that the total weights add up to the size of the, the terms in the, in, the, in, the, in the second part of the equation, which is n minus uh, na, little na. And uh, then they go from there, they take a, a derivative, they get a so-called score equation, right? Unfortunately, this method is not valid in the sense that if you view the uh, U2 as an estimated function, it's no longer unbiased. So if you try to solve that equation equals to zero, you do not get consistent estimate. There's a recent paper published um, in Statistical Medicine. It's actually a part of the PhD thesis of Wen, uh, supervised by Richard and uh, Yan Li. So they realize the previous method by Richard is not valid. They're trying to uh, make a correction. Okay. So what they did is, instead of putting the two samples together, they enlarged the population. So they put the non-probability sample on top of the original population, hypothetically, right? So now you get an enlarged population. Then they define this indicator variable delta. Okay. So if I is in the non-probability sample, one, if uh, the unit is in the uh, original uh, population zero, assuming the non probability sample node is something new, okay, it's not the same units anymore, because otherwise this definition doesn't make any sense, right? So then they're trying to fit the logistical regression over this delta i, okay? So what they, what they really did is they have uh, an objective function eventually uh, called R3, and then if you take a, a partial derivative, and then you get this u, u3. If you say, this looks like what the method in your through the Elin Chin's paper. Uh, yes, so let me go back to what I have there. Okay, uh, what's Elin's paper there? Uh, okay, so uh, Elin's paper, you see in the u1, in the denominator of the terms on the right hand side, there's a one minus pi, okay? Very subtle here. Uh, one minus in the first term, one minus pi in the second term. Uh, in this method by one, and uh, you see there's a one plus pi in the denominator, okay? One plus looks very similar to uh, the one in uh, Elin Chin's paper. But the fundamental difference is Elin's method is derived based on the maximum likelihood, and this U3 is not. Okay, that's the first fundamental difference. However, if you look at the unbiased list of the U3 as an estimated function, it is indeed unbiased. In other words, the method they propose here lead to consistent estimator for the model parameter alpha. Okay, if we already have a parametric form for, for that uh, probability pi i. Now, uh, there's a famous result by my uh, uh, former colleague, Professor Gadambi. Uh, some of you knew that big name. Uh, Professor Gadambi passed away in, in, in 2016 at the age of 90. There's a theory behind, says the estimated equation-based approach, where if you have estimated function derived from the uh, maximum likelihood, that's the optimal uh, way to do it, yeah. So in, in, a, in terms of efficiency, uh, the MRE is always more efficient than the regular uh, estimated equation-based approach. So the reason I'm spending time on this is because in my next section, I'm going to use estimated equation-based approach and combine with calibration. Okay, so that's a very useful uh, approach uh, which has a lot of uh, practical uh, implications. Um, I'm currently working on another project on uh, non-parametric smoothing. Because what you really have here is you look at what's the participation probability. It's a mean function where the response variable is binary, right? So if you uh, use this typical smoothing technique, just treating the, the R, the binary R, as your response, and assuming you know the entire population, and then the smoothest version of this probability pi would be the pi tilde in the middle, right? Now, since you don't know the entire final population, so the pi tilde is not computable. But then uh, you realize the denominator is the population total. You can replace this by a uh, Holson-Thompson estimator. 
using the reference probability sample. And the numerator, the ri is binary. So all the zeros disappeared. So you see, this end up with something computable. Yeah, so currently I'm doing some comparisons and some uh, simulation studies to see uh, how robust is this and uh, how efficient is, is this method. Uh, b before I move on uh, to my next section, any questions? Good. Um, there's a, a very useful approach by combining uh, this estimated equation based idea with calibration. Um, so the reason we're, we're doing this is there's a, a very important idea called a double robustness, uh, which is very popular in missing data and causal inference literature, uh, which is also the theme of uh, uh, Elin Chin's thesis, we, she has a paper published at JASA 2020, uh, uh, became well uh, cited these days. So if you, if you think about model-based prediction, so the population parameter is mu y, and the ideal prediction is for each y, yi, you put a, a, a predict value there. So if you predict every single yi, and the first one there uh, is one type of the prediction, the other form of the prediction is, well, since you already observed the Y for the sample unit, so you shouldn't predict that YI. So keep the observed YI, predict the YI not in the sample, outside the sample in the population. So that's the format of the second one, the uh, MP2. Uh, okay. uh, in a non probability uh, context, uh, realize those are not computable estimators, so you can use this uh, uh, reference probability sample to replace any population totals by a sample-based estimate. So that's the two uh, prediction estimators in the middle of the slides. Indeed, uh, the first estimator, uh, the MP1 hat, is called the mass imputation estimator. So the idea here is, you see, uh, the the estimator is con constructed based on sample B, the reference probability sample. In the reference probability sample, you don't have any YIs. Basically, you impute every single YI there. So that's this term mass imputation uh, came from. Now, if you have a linear model, and if you fit, fit a linear regression model with the intercept, and typically the uh, sum of the residuals is zero. So in that case, these two prediction estimators, uh, they are identical. And then uh, this double robust estimate is, is essentially the idea of combining the IPW estimator and with model-based prediction. And so you see the uh, estimator in the middle. So there's a uh, IPW estimator on the residuals and there's a model-based prediction. And the practically computable estimator in the non probability sample context is the one uh, in the nine below. And this is the one uh, proposed in uh, Elin's JASA paper. And as I mentioned, um, this double robustness is also a big deal in missing data and causal inference. Uh, indeed, this idea of double robustness is already there in survey sampling. And if you uh, read the paper uh, by uh, Cassell, uh, Sander, and uh, Redman, okay, that very famous 1967 by Machuca paper, you see that estimator is already there. Now, what's the difference? The difference is in, uh, in this 1966 paper, they were talking about model assisted estimation where the pi i's are given because they were, they were uh, design weights. You don't have to estimate. So there's no issue of uh, model misspecification there, right? So they were talking about a model misspecification for the autocam regression, yeah. But the ideals are exactly the same. So uh, I, I try to make this clear in a couple of my recent papers. I just say, hey, you guys see missing data causal inference. This is not your invention, okay? <laughs> it's uh, the people working in service uh, invented this. And then if you have a parametric form for that participation probabilities, uh, whether it's logistic regression or anything you want, right, uh, suitable for that binary response, you can construct a user-friendly uh, estimating functions, okay, using that uh, uh, function I call that H here. Because if you take a, a G alpha in this form, 
for any H function you specify, and you can show this G alpha is an unbiased estimating function. So if you set G alpha equal to zero, that's an unbiased estimating equation system. So you can solve to get alpha hat. Now, to really have a solution to the very minimum, the dimension of that H function you specify needs to be in the same dimension of alpha. So if you have three alphas, you need the three uh, H components there, right? And then for all this method I introduced in the previous section, uh, you corresponding to a specific choice of uh, the H function there. One of these choices, okay, is basically just take the X variable. If in your model, the alpha has one component corresponding to the intercept, then the X should have a one as the first component there as well. And so then the previous equation, okay, the G alpha equals to zero becomes this. Now, you can recognize this immediately. This is the calibration equation. On your right hand side is the population control. It's either exactly if you know or it's estimated from your reference probability sample. On your left hand side, that's the uh, inverse weighted estimator. So you basically, if you think about one over pi is your weight, you want to force your weighted estimator match that target. So that's the exact idea of calibration we, we use in, uh, in, in survey uh, sampling. So um, in Elin's thesis, uh, we see, she called that uh, the calibrated IPW. I tried to figure out who uses the earliest. I couldn't find any reference where uh, this term is used before Elin's thesis. Uh, later on, there's a few other people, uh, John Rowe, uh, uh, Bowman, and so uh, in my most recent paper, I also mentioned this. So once you have alpha hat, put it in, you get a pi hat, so now you can do inverse probability weighting. Why this is of interest? Well, if you use this calibrated IPW estimator, you actually achieved double robustness if there's a linear regression model for the outcome regression. And so I have a few lines here. You don't have to read it because it's a little bit heavy. So basically I argue if you use a calibrated IPW estimator, you actually achieved model-based prediction at the same time. But this is important because when I do the uh, calibration-based approach here, you see there's no Y in it. I never fit any Y, even a regression model. I even not trying to find what is the, uh, the beta head. So the beta head is implicitly been handled in that double robust procedure. So um, in, in, um, in one of my recent uh, uh, paper, I, I tried to finish a simulation, just see how good is this approach. Uh, indeed, this is something uh, practical opinion, because if you can achieve a double robustness without estimating, without fitting a model, that's always something desirable, that's number one. Number two, you think about outcome regression, right? So oftentimes, linear regression is always the most popular choice whenever you have a, a continuous type of Y variable there. Uh, uh, even with content, data, people fit linear regression these days. Um, what do I want to say here? Um, maybe I just skip here. Uh, oh, oh, actually, this is important. Okay, this is important. One of the research problems these days is sometimes in the non probability samples, you have 10x variables. I can't find a reference probability sample with all the 10x variables available. But then you may have a situation where you have two or three different reference probability samples. In Canada, for example, we have CCHS, okay, Canadian Community Health Survey. We have general so, uh, social surveys. We have uh, labor force surveys. So if you put all these three uh, reference probability samples together, you get all 10x variables. So the question here is, is there any way you can combine multiple reference probability samples so you can have a much richer auxiliary information to match everything you have on a non probability sample? Now, with this uh, calibration-based approach, this is not a problem at all. Because on the left-hand side, you have 10x variables. Okay, that's what you have. 
On the right-hand side, all you need is the population controls of those 10x variables. And you can, if you can con con compute those controls from different reference probability samples, that's all you needed. Just put them on the right-hand side, you can solve, right? So the last uh, uh, slides I, I, I want to mention is sometimes I heard of people complaining about uh, solving that equation. Uh, okay, that's the one. They say, oh, I always have difficulties to solve this, okay, especially when I have uh, 10x variable in it. Uh, there's an issue with convergence because oftentimes this, uh, the pi function is a nonlinear function, right? So if you want to solve this, you need a, uh, some kind of newton raphson procedure, like iterative procedures. And I try to argue from a theoretical point of view, that is not a problem. Because um, most of the times when you have a parametric form for the pi, uh, this pi is the mean function for uh, the binary variable R, right? So the inclusion indicators. So whatever that function is, typically is in the general framework of general linear models. So in the general linear models, you have this called the uh, inverse uh, link function G, and then you can think about the, the so-called Hirsch matrix because that's the one you need for the newton raphson You can argue that Hirsch matrix is actually negative definite. Okay, so uh, if anybody familiar with this uh, uh, iterative procedures, um, if the Hirsch metric is a negative definite, the, the, there's a guaranteed convergence by solving that equation using iterative procedures. So um, I haven't played around with this uh, 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 iterative procedure, uh, but I, I, I try to uh, do some empirical investigations to see if any of these complaints of convergence uh, is really uh, an issue. My good friend Jae Kwon Kim used to complain with me. Say, I have problems solving that equation, uh, and I try to argue uh, that shouldn't be the case. So this is basically uh, the first half uh, of, of this presentation. I'm going to switch gear to, to something else. Um, any, any questions? May I have yeah. a question? Yeah. Um, when, uh, it, it seems to me that in the rigorously non-Bayesian uh, 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 position of your problem, there is to estimate both pi and big N. Are these two estimations uh, uh, independent or as a, it seemed to me, I didn't follow very well, they are the same thing. They are one the consequences of the other. The, the two estimation of, yeah. uh, I'm, I don't know You're if- You're asking the yeah. estimate of population size? E exactly, the population oh, yeah. no, that, size and the that's pi. That's a simple, uh, yeah. a simple Sim estimate yeah, yeah. Uh, Let me go back to that very quickly. Yeah, yeah. quickly. Thank uh, you. Somewhere there's an estimator for, uh, I use somewhere, N. I saw a formula where <laughs> there were the two <laughs> estimates okay. together. Uh, yeah. Somewhere, uh, uh, Let me go back to, I think, oh, that's the one, right? Yeah, yeah okay. Uh, yeah, let's just. Uh, there is a link between the two. Yeah, one is yeah. the other. Yeah, no, um, yeah. technically, you can use any estimator available uh, for n. For example, the n hat could be the sum of the weights in the reference probability sample. Okay, that's also possible. But it's preferred here because this is a well known Hayek estimator. Yeah, it's a Hayek estimator, and so it's preferred. Uh, indeed, there's a, a, a sufficient evidence in literature, uh, in empirical studies. So for this estimator presented here, even you know the population size n, cap n, don't use it, okay, use n hat. Okay, that's, that's the message, yeah. This is one of the funny things in statistics. <laughs> you use the estimate is better than the truth, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Just a moment, we have to, to listen you yeah. for the yeah. registration, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. The, the point of convergence you're talking about here, it's only a problem if you want to find the alpha that gives you these pies directly. What about just finding those pies for the i's in S8 numerically? 
I mean, you start with some pi, and then yeah. you calibrate, so you only find this numerical. You don't have to solve the alpha in a way. Or the, you just need the pi, right? So if you just, for example, if you start with your original method, uh, sort of the, the previously, which is not doubly robust, yeah. you just did this one, that yeah. is your starting point, and mm. then you dig into the calibration, so you've got the pies, it's not maybe optimal in some sense, but it practically, it should give you, you just get the pies numerically, that's enough, should be. Yeah, so let me just repeat the question. Um, if you have your initial estimate of the participating probabilities, so no, if you want to calibrate, you can just uh, uh, get the calibration weights, Right. Uh, the answer is yes, that's probably one, one approach, yeah. Uh, but uh, this is just a different way of doing it. Uh, it will be interesting to see if there's any difference between the two, yeah. So, um, uh, very good point, yeah. And this uh, two-stage uh, approach will be mentioned in, in, in uh, I think, in the next, okay? <laughs> uh, in a different context. Um, okay, so, uh, this, this topic about uh, post-stratification uh, is more of a continuation of the discussion on uh, inverse probability weighting. Now, we all know there's an issue with inverse probability weighting, and it's well-known in missing data and causal inference. So, you fit a model, say, logistic regression for the pi, oftentimes there are some estimate pi i's extremely small because it's exponential scale, log scale unit, okay? So, if you do inverse probability weighting, then uh, some of these uh, uh, things just blew things up. So the, the performance is very unstable. So the variance is very large. So now I'm gonna try to find a way to address that issue. Okay, I will start with this um, a simple scenario. Okay, what is IPW when I have a simple scenario? There's two components in X, okay? Uh, let's say uh, X1 is gender, X2 is age groups, okay? Um, just, uh, for simplicity, I'm assuming there's two genders here, okay? <laughs> One and a zero, and three age groups. So you basically have two by three, three uh, class, uh, cross-classified groups. With each group, the X1, X2, all the same. Now, if you look at the, uh, the uh, participation probability depend on X only, which means the participation probability now will be a constant within each of these cells. So in general, if you have a, a scenario where the X variables are all uh, discrete, say binary, categorical, all this. So in theory, you can partition your sample based on the combination of levels of the X variables. And then once you partition the samples into the subsamples, within each of the subsample, the participation probabilities become a constant. Okay, that has a very important consequence so, if you use inverse probability weighting, the participation probabilities with each of the cell basically becomes the sampling fraction. So, it's an expected sample size divided by the subpopulation size, okay, the NK. So, if you want to estimate this, basically, it's an estimate of this little NK, cap NK. If you can estimate this, that's your estimated probability. And then you just, the little NK, of course, is estimated by the observed number. The cap NK, which means the population cell size, okay, is, is, which is something I'm gonna address later on. Uh, and if you put it in with the inverse probability weighting, you see your IPW estimator reduced to this uh, well-known post-stratified uh, estimator, where you take a simple average of your observed YI within that subsample, and the key quantity here in that estimator is this WK hat. That's the population stratum weight, okay? It's the number of, uh, number of units in a subpopulation divided the uh, total number of units in, a po in that population, which we don't know, okay? We don't know. And here is a very important way of using your reference probability sample. You do the same cross-classification in the reference probability sample. You get the subsamples there, SP1, SP, SPK. And then you have this weights attached to the units in each of these uh, subsamples. You just add them up with each of the subsamples. That is indeed a valid estimate for the population size NK. So now you have a way to compute this, which is the well-known uh, 
post ratified sample. So in, in a lot of scenarios, uh, in probability samples, you know the population uh, striatum weights, the WK. In this case, you have to find a way to estimate. So that's uh, how you estimate this using uh, the re reference probability sample. In general, there's a couple of issues here. One is, even you have a scenario where you have X variables all discrete, but just imagine if you have many X variables, let's say 10, right, you have 10. Well, even single X variables is binary, you have 10 of them. The number of cross-classified cells is a two to the power of 10. That's more than 1,000, okay? And if you have a smaller sample size there, you can uh, divide your samples into more than 1,000 cells. Okay? That's the first problem, right? The second problem is with this kind of idea is, I oftentimes have X variables with all kind of uh, type. There's continuous, there's uh, const data, there's a binary, all of this. So how do all these ideas of post stratification cannot be applied anymore? Well, so here's how you do this uh, in general. And indeed, uh, uh, the previous question fr uh, from Nichen on <laughs> this two-stage uh, idea is there. So first, what I'm going to do is, I just estimate this partisan uh, patient probability using a chosen parametric model, whatever that model is, okay? Once I have estimated participation probabilities for every unit in my non-probability sample, I order them from the smallest to the largest. So the ideal now is this ordering provide the ideal of small participation probability, large participation probability. So I'm gonna cut them into groups, okay? And within a single group, the variation of this weights is relatively small compared to the entire uh, sample. I basically just treat them as the same, okay? Treat them as a constant. So that's basically how I do it. So if I do this, I have this subsample SA1, SA2 through this uh, parti uh, partition of uh, the sample using this initial estimate participating probabilities. And then the other thing I need in order to compute a post-stratified estimator is this um, population stratum weight. And here is how I do it, okay? Because I already have that uh, fitted model for the pi with the estimate alpha hat. So with, in my reference probability sample, I have X variables observed for each of the unit. I do the same thing. I compute the participation probabilities in my reference probability sample and I know where I cut my, in the previous group, yes, so here's the important. So in the non probability samples, I know exactly where I cut it, okay, in terms of this uh, partition of the sample. So the boundary is there. In my reference probability sample, after I compute this estimate participation probabilities, I just basically put each of the units into one of the groups I already have using the boundaries. The boundary is already there. And once I have the partition, so now I have the subsamples SB1, SB2, SBK, where each unit has a survey weights. All I need to do is just add, up, add them up. Okay, I get this estimate NK. And that's how I get this uh, uh, weights for uh, the each of this uh, strata. So now you have these two things, right? Uh, the partition of the subsamples and this population strata weights. So now you can uh, compute this post-stratified uh, estimator um, I think there's some uh, potential here. This will provide some kind of robustness in terms of, uh, against this extremely small uh, estimated uh, participating probabilities. Um, I have a postdoc. Uh, she is working on some of the empirical stud studies. So there are some, there are some results there, and hopefully I'll be able to uh, report this uh, at a later time. Post stratification okay, is related to the IPW estimator, but I think in, in practice uh, there's a potential. This is a useful method. I have one more topic left. Uh, if anybody got a got a, a question, uh, Natalie, yeah, uh, we we need the microphone in order for people online to hear. Um,
Thank you very much. This is really interesting because this is exactly the methods that I did without having all this theoretical background. So just to say we had a huge non-probability sample in the United Kingdom for ethnic minority groups and we did the uh, propensity, uh, you know, the formula from your paper. Uh, we did the post-stratification because again that reduced the volatility of the inverse propensity weighting. We calibrated using those pseudo-design weights. The calibration also helps with the coverage errors as well. And finally, the, um, the issue of um, the probability-based sample. We actually did a mass-imputed statistical matching to bring all of these uh, uh, participation variables, target variables in the propensity model uh, from the social survey, from the labor first survey, as you say. So if anybody wants to hear about this very large scale uh, survey that we just completed, I'm happy to talk at, during the breaks. Very interesting, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is... The microphone is not working. Is it working? Mm. I'll put it one more time. This is, can you, uh, this is very interesting, but the assumption here that uh, the relationship uh, among X and Y variable is, uh, can be observed uh, without bias, the relationship uh, in the, Yeah, um, I'm not exactly sure I uh, got all the uh, part of the question, but I think the, the issue really is uh, sometimes there's a relationship uh, between Y and X, and that relationship can affect the performance of the weighted estimator, is that right? So maybe I will just make two uh, uh, basic comments here. The strong point of IPW estimator, why that is um, popular, because it is a general tool, has nothing to do with any particular Y. So once you have this estimated uh, participation probabilities, or you have this uh, post-stratification formulated already, you have this uh, uh, estimate for the uh, strat population stratum weight, you can handle any Y. Okay, that's, that's the uh, uh, very important aspect of IPW estimator. Any prediction-based approach and any double robustness-based approach, technically, you need to do this one at a time for a particular Y. So it's a Y specific. Now, oftentimes, you don't have the expertise to derive the things by yourself. Uh, so it, it all depends on how much uh, tools you have there. Yeah. Um, there's a degree of uh, how much I can do and uh, uh, how much efficiency I want to gain through extra effort. Yeah. Are there other questions? And are there questions from... Okay, uh, thank you. So, uh, yeah, this post stratification. So, the, starting with the probabilities, uh, pies could be sort of small, unstable, and things like that. So, uh, and you, you divide them into, into post strata. I mean, there are people doing these, smoothing those probabilities directly. That, that's also a way. But if you can think, if you say, okay, if I smooth them directly, obviously I will introduce some bias, but hopefully. So, it's a trade off thing, right? Mm. And I think what you're suggesting here, 
you also have these, uh, it's, it's essentially like a statistical matching, like basically you try to find the right unit in the B to be in the, in the stratum, but of course the way you match them could be wrong. So this matching error is also potentially a, a source of bias, sort of variance trade-off. So it would be interesting to say which way, sort of the more immediate smoothing or whether going via this way is actually, uh, can achieve a better bias variance trade-off. I think that's the issue. Yeah, I, I fully agree. Uh, so this idea of uh, post stratification uh, indeed is a is a open topic uh, for for research. Uh, you see, I didn't really mention the second part of the, of the slides there. Uh, we all know this with uh, post stratification. What's the choice of k? Right? Uh, depends on how big is your sample size. Uh, so if your sample size is small, and you shouldn't partition them into too many groups, right? Uh, if you have a large sample size, and typically. Uh, the rule of thumb is you should have at least 30 uh, observations in each of the subsample. Okay, that's a, a typical rule we use in, in practice. Back to the old days when we teach uh, statistics uh, courses, we say, well, the sample size is large, central limit theorem hold. So what do you mean sample size are large? Oh, bigger than 30. <laughs> that's what we talk about in the past, right? These days is no longer, <laughs> that, this old days is, long, uh, is long gone. Uh, we have millions, millions of data points these days. So anyway, so I'm gonna uh, mention very briefly my last topic here. Oh, there's another question? Okay. Go ahead, please. Mm -hmm. If the variable x, i are larger, there's a large dimensionality and you don't have such a big reference sample, uh, would it make sense to try to reduce the dimensionality of x, i, to make, do some, uh, some dimensionality reduction and and, uh, and work on, on, on less dimension, try to exploit the redundancy that probably is, is in, the, in the vector of xi, in the subspace of xi. You refer to dimension of the x variables? Yes. Yeah, so uh, this is uh, uh, clearly something doable. If you, even if you fit the logistic regression to the participation probabilities, uh, you can always try uh, variable selection uh, as an initial step before you fit the final model. In many of the scientific uh, settings, there's a good sense of uh, which x variable is important, which is not. Indeed, you can have a very uh, informed judgment just based on the scenario you have. Uh, recently, I, I was a part of this um, uh, project run by Kaihai, Canadian Institute of uh, Health Information. They do a non probability survey on mental health uh, situations in Canada, so on the service centers in communities. So they have a very good idea on what kind of uh, features in terms of age, gender, education level, income level, affect participation. So they have a very good idea of what are the important X variables. They have to be part of the equation. So they have a whole bunch of other variables there. They, they are not so sure. So you can actually do a variable selection. Yeah. So Indeed, all this are open, and uh, if you have the expertise, it's do the best thing you can. So, please, uh, I can five more ten, minutes. Five so minutes. then I'm okay. gonna you can finish. conclude. <laughs> uh, so I recently have a paper. Uh, this will appear uh, in the December issue of survey methodology, uh, discuss some of the aspect of uh, end of coverage problems with non-probability samples. If you look at the two assumptions we, uh, we introduced earlier, assumption one is so-called ignorability assumption, which means uh, the sample participation is independent of the Y given the features of the unit. Um, in practice, yeah, I just mentioned that example. Uh, if you feel you can identify the key variables uh, describe participation behaviors, then you have a pretty confident uh, statement about that assumption. Yeah, so yeah, I know most of the uh, uh, important X variables are observed, so I'm quite confident with assumption A1, okay? Now, assumption A2, the positivity assumption, um, this is well known in, in survey sampling, by the way, okay? Uh, if you have a zero inclusion probability for probability samples, 
which means that unit will never be in your sample. You have an end coverage problem. So you, you can theoretically define a subpopulation where the participation probability is zero, which means that part of the population will never be part of your data set, will never be represented by your sample. Now, what are the consequences of violations of the posit positivity assumption? Violation of the positivity assumption leads to invalid IPW-based estimator, even the first assumption is valid. And so I put this uh, uh, a simple statement here. Uh, it's well known in, in probability samples, okay? The Hobson-Thompson estimator is designed and biased if and only if all the inclusion probabilities are positive. This is actually a wild assignment question for stats 454 I, I taught many times you know, at Waterloo. Um, the violation of this positivity assumption, even invalid model-based uh, prediction, okay? So the model-based prediction estimator is also invalid if that assumption is valid. When people do model-based prediction, okay, they have to fit the model, trying to get the uh, predicted value, right? We have the crucial argument in fitting the model using the data you have is the equation two. It says the condition, conditional mean of y given x and ri equal one is the same as the conditional mean of y given x. The reason is given x, y, and r are in, independent, so you can drop it. That is important because when you want to fit a model-based prediction, you want to fit the model on the right-hand side of the equation two. Equation two says you can actually use data where ri equals one, which is the left-hand side. That's exactly the observed pairs you have, okay? So you can fit the data of y given x using the non-probability sample. Once the model is, you, you fit it, you can use that model to get predicted values with whatever the x you observed. But here's the problem, okay? Equation two implicitly require the probability ri equals one is not zero. Now we all know this, when you define the conditional probability of A given B, okay, the probability B cannot be zero. <laughs> because the probability A given B, if B is impossible, okay, you are, you are, you are saying something that's false, okay? You cannot, say something based on assumption, that's never be true, right? So that's the same thing here. So if you have this uh, uh, pos pos positivity assumption violated, and model-based prediction is also invalid, whatever that say you have. So um, whole series is an uh, undercoverage problem, or depends on the size of uh, the subpopulation uh, not covered by your sample, and also, the difference between the two subpopulations. So this is all the common knowledge we know in, uh, in probability sampling. Uh, in the recent paper, we had some kind of discussion of two scenarios, where it's called a stochastic annual coverage, the other one is called a deterministic annual coverage. Uh, indeed, it is the deterministic annual coverage that are actually problematic, yeah. So I don't want to get into too much details. Uh, so the paper is available. Uh, if anybody is interested, our, our uh, uh, send you a copy. Uh, in the paper, we try to argue the calibrated IPW estimator uh, seems to be a useful tool uh, to uh, deal with this under coverage problems. Uh, especially, you have a very reliable population control. Okay, that's very important. If the population control is very reliable, the calibrated IPW estimator can be a very useful tool handling uh, this coverage problem. Uh, post stratification once again, maybe a useful tool. This is an open um, topic, and uh, I hope some of you guys uh, are interested in this topic. And uh, you may have a real data set. Can, you can play around, just see uh, uh, what you, you can get from this, this kind of uh, uh, method. Theoretically, What's really going on is, if you, if you wanna deal with this under coverage problem, you need to know which part is uncovered. That's the bottom line story. If you have no clue about which part is uncovered, you will never really solve the problem fully, period. And in, in the paper uh, to, to, 
to appear in several methodology, we have an ideal. The ideal is, we, we call that a convex hull formulation. So basically, what are we trying to use? The reference probability sample, we're trying to partition that sample using the so-called convex hull ideal. Okay, where uh, we can split the sample B, which represent, is, which is supposed to represent the entire population. One part represent the non-probability sample, the other part is the uncovered part of the population where you have some kind of information there. Um, and if you want to provide a solution that is scientifically definable, you need a subsample from that second part. Okay. So we have some details there uh, in, in the paper, uh, but this is a hard uh, problem. Uh, knowing to survey samplers uh, all these years, uh, under coverage, you need additional information to provide a sound solution. Uh, with non probability samples, this is even harder, right? So, um, hopefully, some of the ideas presented in this paper uh, will be useful uh, for people to continue the research on, on, on this topic. So, I do not want to get into any of the details. I just want to stop here before I have two more, three more slides of conclusions. Uh, any questions on this topic? I wonder if uh, uh, there are uh, questions coming from the people that is connected outside this room. Uh, is, is there someone? Ah, oh, please. Come on. Can people online ask questions? No. Yes, there, but there is a question uh, related. Okay, was uh, at the, for the early beginning of the presentation. I just uh, we just see was related to the why RI is called sample uh, is coming from Alina Matei from uh, the University of Neuchatel. Why RI is called sample inclusion indicator? The random mechanism is not associated with non probability sample, but with the random event that unit A has where the questionnaire associated to the non probability sample. From this point of view, RI should be called participation indicator. This is uh, the, the only question I write. Just arrived. Why we call that a participation probability? Um, she said because the random mechanism is not associated with non probability sample, but with the random event that unit A has where the questioner associated to the non probability sample. From this point of view, a right should be called participation indicator and not sample inclusion indicator. Yeah, I don't really fully understand the question. Uh, uh, maybe uh, it is a, a problem of definition. Yes, of it's, what? it's yeah. just yeah. A, a, it's a problem of um, mm. definition, yeah, yes, or, or, or label. This is the only question. I think that uh, uh, we will have the time of discuss about this to, to understand better and okay. in, yeah. in the f yeah. mm. in a. Next future, we can. Other questions from the floor? Do you want to, 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 yeah, I'm gonna to finish insist it. in the concluding remarks? Yeah, could, uh, okay, thank you. But uh, uh, I received uh, the information that in 10 minutes we have to go to the coffee break. And this is mandatory, of course. So I have uh, maybe three more slides. I just read them through. Um, there is an issue of survey design for non probability samples, uh, because sometimes people just say, there, there's no design. Of course, if the data comes as they are from the web, uh, uh, you don't have this uh, kind of design problems uh, clearly defined. But if you are going to uh, take a sample, uh, there is a design issue. Basically, there are two aspects of the design issue. The first one is, uh, what are the variables you are going to uh, observe, okay, include them in, a, in the data set? This is so crucial because the quality of the X variables are so crucial for the validity of assumption A1 and A2. If you already have the data set, all in a sudden you realize, uh oh, there's two X variables so important, but are not in the data set. So this is what, I'm, uh, what I said, the design issue, you have to uh, plan ahead. The second aspect of design issues with non probable samples is, even you know certain X variables are important, 
you ask yourself, can I find the reference probability sample where all these extra variables are available? Yeah. So in the Kaha example I just mentioned, so we were able to find most of the X variables in CCHS, the Canadian Community Health Survey. So the final report uh, presented to the board of directors, uh, they were very happy with the argument of the team and they were very happy to see the result. So there's a comparison of naive estimators and uh, the estimators we presented there. So there are issues with uh, uh, design. I always want to emphasize these two concepts, uh, validity and efficiency whenever you do statistical inference with any data, right? Um, validity refers to the consistency of the point estimate. Okay, this is always important. You have a consistent estimator for the parameter of interest. This is the minimum requirement in order for you to present your result to anybody, okay? Not just the government and your users. Now there's efficiency, and efficiency is typically measured by the asymptotic variance of your estimator. If you don't have validity, then there's no point to talk about efficiency. So I, I always said validity is always the primary goal of any estimation method, and efficiency is secondary in the sense that if you have competing method, two different point estimators, so now you can say which one I'm using, right? So which one is more efficient? Sometimes non probability samples have a very large sample size and people get excited with a large sample size. Large sample size are double-edged sword. Okay, so if you have a valid estimate, then large sample size bring you efficiency in terms of very small uh, variance. But if you have an invalid estimator, in the sense that it is biased, then large sample size makes the bias even more pronounced. And so this is something people sometimes forget. Okay, just say a large sample size for solve my problem. So this is one of the uh, very well-known example uh, quoted in Shirley Moon's paper in 2018. So we are a non-probability sample with 80% coverage of the entire population provide a better result than a small probability sample, let's say a sampling fraction two or three percent, right? The answer is not necessarily. The, 80% coverage of a non-probability sample can give you a horrible result. Just think about a survey of income, okay? If the 20 highest income people refuse to participate, you won't get anything valid in your non-probability sample, even you get the rest 80% of the pop, no, or entire country. Do we still need probability surveys, right? Uh, so let me read this uh, thing through. Non-probability samples uh, do not fit into a traditional design-based or model-based inferential frameworks for probability survey samples. Design-based theory for probability sample, samples, however, uh, play a crucial role in the development of methodologies and strategies in dealing with non-probability samples. All the recent research on non-probability samples, you see there's always a root or a connection to the method we developed over the last 70 years in, for design-based inference. And indeed, there's a newfound rule of probability several samples in terms of providing valid uh, information for the target population. So th this is uh, what I copied from my uh, review paper uh, uh, last year. I have a, a few uh, references uh, listed here. And then um, I have two chapters in my book uh, dealing with some of the issues I discussed, especially chapter nine, there's a lengthy discussion about validity and efficiency in the missing data context. All these uh, uh, discussions can be copied here with the non-probability samples. And the, the last chapter on non-probability samples, essentially I, I use some of the materials from Elin Chin's uh, uh, thesis. If you, never see my book, uh, so this is the one, uh, available from Springer link. Uh, if you have an institutional membership of Springer, uh, you can download the PDF file for free. That's all I have. Thank you so much. So, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, well, we are three minutes in advance, 
uh, for the coffee break. We have to thank first our wonderful speaker uh, that gave us a wonderful masterclass, but I think that we need some rest to drink a coffee and so on. Very slowly we can go. Uh, I think it, there is a room in the, in the corridor, if I do remember well. Uh, so, yes, it is uh, just on the left. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. So each of us is welcome to the coffee break. Thank you. We have to be here again in 20 minutes, more or less. Okay? Try to be on time.